1944, the eve of the Allied invasion of Europe. General Dwight Eisenhower walks among his men to wish them good luck and Godspeed. He fears that 80% of these paratroopers may be killed in the first hours of D-Day. But Eisenhower has no choice. The final responsibility for the lives of these men, for the success of history's greatest invasion, rests with Dwight Eisenhower, supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe. Years later, he will call this the climax of my life. Dwight David Eisenhower is born in 1890 near the frontier town of Denison, Texas. Little Ike, as he is called, develops a love for the rugged outdoors, and he often joins friends on camping trips into the Kansas backcountry, outings he calls Wild West Adventures. Eisenhower's military career begins at the age of 20, when a friend talks him into taking the entrance examination for the Naval Academy at Annapolis. Almost as an afterthought, young Eisenhower also takes the test for West Point. The Navy turns him down because he's too old, but the Army will accept him. Fresh from the Midwest, Eisenhower especially enjoys the social life of a West Point cadet. As a student, he takes life as easy as possible, and he pays for it with demerits. Writes one of his instructors, we didn't see in him a man who would work at his job so completely that nothing else would matter. On the athletic field, however, Eisenhower is a promising army halfback, but a severe knee injury forces him to quit football and almost causes his discharge from the academy. Says the discouraged Eisenhower, I wish I could get out of here and back to the plains of Kansas again but he sticks it out at West Point. Dwight Eisenhower graduates 61st in a class of some 150 cadets. As a new second lieutenant, he's assigned to Fort Sam Houston in Texas. Ike now meets and begins courting Mamie Geneva Dow. She's fresh out of finishing school, the daughter of one of the wealthiest men in town. Their marriage in the summer of 1916 is a major social event in San Antonio. During World War I, Captain Eisenhower commands America's only tank training center. He impresses his superior officers by taking the hastily built camp and whipping it into a highly efficient post. Following the armistice, Dwight Eisenhower takes on the routine duties of a peacetime career officer. Now a major, his sole ambition is to reach the rank of full colonel before retiring from the army. 1932, World War I veterans riot in Washington, demanding payment of a promised bonus. Eisenhower assists Army Chief of Staff Douglas MacArthur in clearing the demonstrators out of the capital. Still only a major after years of training assignments and desk jobs, Ike will soon become MacArthur's assistant in the Philippines. In the Philippines, MacArthur and Eisenhower set out to build from scratch a Philippine army and defense system. Eisenhower learns at first hand the intricacies of diplomacy and high-level staff work. September 1941. With World War II already raging in Europe, the Army plans its largest peacetime exercise, the Louisiana Maneuvers. Colonel Eisenhower is given a top-level staff position. All the old timers, he writes, say we're going into a god-awful spot, but I like to go to the field. Eisenhower's brilliant staff work in the mock battle brings him to the attention of his superiors and wins him a promotion to brigadier general. 
The raise in rank surprises Ike. When they get down to my place on the list, he says, they're passing out stars with considerable abandon. 1942. The nation is at war. But Eisenhower is again saddled with a desk job. As chief of the operations division in Washington, however, Eisenhower quickly pinpoints the flaw in America's early wartime strategy. We've got to quit wasting resources all over the world, he warns. We must go to Europe and fight if we are to keep Russia as an ally. The Army's chief of staff, General George Marshall, now makes a startling move. He advances Eisenhower over 366 senior officers and appoints him head of the European Theater of Operations. Many say Marshall's decision is a big gamble, but the chief of staff insists that Eisenhower's organizational ability, his natural instinct for diplomacy, make him the best man for bringing the United States and the Allies together in close cooperation. December 1943. Eisenhower, now a four-star general, meets with President Roosevelt in North Africa. The president tells Ike that he has been chosen to head Operation Overlord, the crucial allied invasion of Europe, whose most ambitious dream only two years before had been to command a regiment, is appointed supreme allied commander in Europe. He will now lead the greatest invasion armada in history. Under General Eisenhower's direction, all of southern England now becomes a vast arsenal of men and weapons, the largest military concentration the world has ever seen. The lives of a quarter of a million men and the success of Operation Overlord rest on the decisions of one man. Eisenhower alone must give the signal for the cross-channel invasion to begin. Ike has written a strange memo to himself about his responsibility for the invasion's outcome. He carries it in his pocket at all times. The last words read, if any blame is attached to this attempt, it is mine alone. Tuesday, June 6, 1944. An invasion armada of 5,000 ships stands ready in the English Channel. Now, Eisenhower gives the signal that will trigger the fall of Adolf Hitler's Germany. He speaks the plain words of a soldier from Kansas. Okay, he says, let's go. Western Europe. The landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is but the opening phase of the campaign in Western Europe. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us now. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute. Together we shall achieve victory. The Allied armies under General Dwight Eisenhower have won the war in Europe. Eisenhower returns to America one of the great heroes of his time. At the height of his reception in New York, Mayor LaGuardia makes the five-star general an honorary citizen of the city. Mr. Mayor and New Yorkers, as my first act as a citizen 
of the city of New York, I want to issue to the mayor a word of warning. New York simply can't do this to a Kansas farmer boy and keep its reputation for sophistication. Early in 1948, Eisenhower takes leave from active military duty to accept a position as president of Columbia University. His decision brings a wave of political speculation. Many say his position at Columbia is the first step in a Republican plan to groom him for the 1948 presidential nomination. General, how about the rumors uh, about you in politics? I can repeat only what I have so often said before. I intend to have nothing whatsoever to do with partisan politics. I will never seek political office. Uh, moreover, it is my conviction that a man who has spent his life in the professional military service should never enter partisan politics and seek an office. Efforts to sweep Ike into politics continue straight through to convention time, but he insists on playing the part of spectator. The Eisenhower for President movement, however, will continue to grow during the next four years. Spring, 1952. Ike is in Europe. President Truman has recalled the general to active service as supreme commander of the NATO forces. Republican Party strategists in the United States, however, have entered Eisenhower's name in several presidential primaries. Though he has vowed to stay out of politics, overwhelming victories in these elections sway Eisenhower. He cannot ignore, he says, this clear-cut call to political duty. After 37 years of military service, Dwight Eisenhower returns to the United States a political newcomer seeking his nation's highest office. Ike delivers his first political speech in the wake of a Midwestern cloudburst. As a campaigner, he lacks professional polish, but one reporter writes, the mere sight of General Eisenhower makes people happy. Today, America must be spiritually, economically, and militarily strong for her own sake and for humanity. She must guard her solvency as she does her physical frontier. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we can have peace with honor, reasonable security with national solvency. I believe in the future of the United States of America. Within two months, Ike captures the Republican nomination for President of the United States. Eisenhower, with Senator Richard Nixon as his running mate, begins his presidential campaign. Says one seasoned observer, he must be prepared to meet the sun every day as if it could cast a ballot. November 4th, 1952, the anticipated Eisenhower landslide sweeps all but nine states. 
Dwight Eisenhower becomes the president of a nation caught in the turbulence of the 1950s. The people of the free world will look to him as their leader in the fight against communist tyranny and the threat of atomic war. Coming months will be fraught with fateful decisions. Decisions which will lead this world out of fear and into peace. To the making of these fateful decisions, the United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. Soon after his Atoms for Peace proposal to the United Nations, Eisenhower goes to Geneva to meet with Soviet Premier Khrushchev. At this summit conference in July 1955, the president boldly proposes that the Soviets open their skies to inspection by the free world. The plan will eventually be rejected by the Russians. But Eisenhower's efforts help momentarily to ease Cold War tensions. He has created a new spirit, the spirit of Geneva. For his role as a peacemaker, Eisenhower is hailed not only by his own nation, but by most of the free world. Now, Ike begins a fateful vacation in Colorado. September 24th, 1955. News that the president has suffered a heart attack stuns the nation. Washington rocks with uncertainty. Market prices plunge. Americans fear they will lose Eisenhower's leadership. The crisis will drag on for months. Finally, early in 1956, Dr. Paul Dudley White reports to the nation. We believe that medically, the chances are that the president should be able to carry on an active life satisfactorily for another five to 10 years. With the presidential nominations only a few months away, Americans now ask, is Ike willing to run for re-election? Eisenhower's answer is a vigorous yes. The 1956 elections bring a sweeping victory for Eisenhower. As if to set the stage for his second term, the Cold War erupts momentarily into a shooting war. Against this backdrop of crisis, Dwight Eisenhower begins his most crucial years as president. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union beats America into space with the launching of Sputnik 1. It is a tremendous propaganda victory for communism. Ike's opponents charge that the nation's space program, even the national security, have been neglected in favor of balancing the budget. The president's critics now begin to suggest that he doesn't work hard enough at the presidency. One frequent comment is that he plays too much golf. But Ike refuses to give up these moments of relaxation. Late in 1959, President Eisenhower tries again to ease mounting Cold War tensions. He receives Nikita Khrushchev in Washington, hoping to reach a better understanding between East and West. The talks are inconclusive, but preliminary groundwork is laid for a summit conference in the near future. Dwight Eisenhower now travels through Africa, Europe, and Asia on an exhausting goodwill tour. His mission, he says, is peace and understanding among nations. Ike's remarkable personal diplomacy captures the hearts of millions of people. May 1960. On the eve of the most promising summit conference, 
news out of Moscow shakes the world. Says Pravda, an American U-2 spy plane has been shot down over Russia. Khrushchev charges that its mission was espionage. Washington tries to cover up by denying knowledge of spy flights. But the story backfires and provides the Soviets with an excuse for torpedoing the summit conference. The failure of the summit conference only months before the end of his second term is a deep disappointment for Eisenhower. Regretfully, the president says, we could not in these eight years get to the place where we could say, it now looks as if permanent peace with justice is really in sight. January 1961, Dwight Eisenhower escorts his successor, John F. Kennedy, to the inauguration. Ike will now retire to his farm at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, his first permanent home in almost half a century of service to his nation. He will continue, however, to be active, both as the nominal head of his party and as an elder statesman. Wherever he travels, Ike receives the same tremendous popular acclaim accorded him during his years as president. History's judgment on Eisenhower, writes one reporter, may be good or bad, but there is little doubt of the American people's judgment. Whatever the sum of his setbacks and successes, Dwight Eisenhower will surely be remembered for having held the abiding affection of the nation he led. Thank you.